We asked Marshall McLuhan what influence Wyndham Lewis had on him. Good heavens, I, that, that's where I got it. <laughs> it was Lewis who put me onto all this study of the environment as, uh, as an educational, as a teaching machine. Uh, that were there, to use our more recent terminology, uh, Lewis uh, was the person who showed me that the man-made environment was a teaching machine, a programmed teaching machine. But here, earlier, you see, the uh, symbolists had discovered that the work of art is a programmed teaching machine. It's a mechanism for shaping sensibility. Well, Lewis simply extended this private art activity to the corporate activity of the whole society in making environments that basically were artifacts or works of art and that acted as teaching machines upon the whole population. Why was this book of poems called One Way Song? In many of his writings he asserts the primacy of the, of the visual in his perception and his um, general uh, feeling of preference for the visual over the other senses. His feeling was that uh, the passion for musical form in the later 19th century and in his own time uh, betrayed this, betrayed our traditional visual values. Now, the clue then to one-way song may be in the, the fact that the visual sense is the only sense we have that is continuous and connected. All the other senses are discontinuous, whether touch, which every moment of which is different from every other moment, or hearing, which is discontinuous. The interval is necessary for the very act of hearing. In sight alone, or in the visual alone, is there a continuum a connected universe that we associate with rationality and detachment. But one-way song seems to draw attention to these qualities of rationality and detachment and continuity and connectedness in thought and perception. Now, back to Wyndham Lewis in 1940, reading Song of the Militant Romance, from One Way Song. Militant Romance. Again, let me do a lot of extraordinary talking. Again, let me do a lot. Let me abound in speeches. Let me abound, publicly polyglot. Better a blind word to bluster with. Better a bad word than none leave a got. Watch me push into my witch's vortex all the Englishmen's got to cackle and rattle with. You catch my intention to be busily balking with tongue-tied Britain. That is my outlandish plot, to put a spark in his damp feet, a squib for the Scotchman, starch for the Irish, to give a Teutonic come Scot, and uh, breadth to all that is slender in Anglo come Oxford or Saxony, over pretty in Ari, to give to this watery galaxy a Norseman sea salted stamina, brand Walsall salt blood. As to the trick of the prosody, the method of conveying the matter, frankly, I shall provoke the maximum saxophone clatter. I shall not take limping iambics, nor borrow from Archilochus, his light horse garret, nor drive us into a sort, short distance that would bog us. I shall not go back to shell tonics, nor listen to Dr. Guest. I know with my bold fortina, I have the measure that suits us best. I shall drive the matter along as I have driven it from the first. My peristalsis is well nigh perfect in burst upon well-timed burst. I shall drive my coach and four through the strictest of difficult treatises. I do not want to know too closely the number of beats it is. So shipwreck the nerves to enable the vessel the better to float. This cockle shells what it first was built for, and a most seaworthy boat. At roll call, Baron Dominus uttered at a fool's school, shouted by Scottish ushers, caused his lordship to sob like a fool. Yet Byron was the first to laugh at the oversensitive teats, snuffed out by an article, those were the words. A couple of rubber teats should have been supplied beyond any question to these over-touchy pets. For me, you were free to spit your hardest and explode your bloody spleen regarding my bold, compact fourteener, or my four less than fourteen. 
So set up a shouting for me, get a Donnybrook, re Donnybrook racket on, hound down the drowsy letting Goliaths that clutter the lexicon, send a contingent over to intone in our battle line, rinse the trumpet out of the centre of the monkish Leonine, court-martial the stripping stackers who dance in the dull rhyme royal, send staggering out all the stammerers who stick round as Chaucer's foil, dig out the dogs from the doggerel of the huge breasted couplet, hot up the coldest mutton songbirds of the Plantagenet cabinet, go back to the confessor's palace and disentangle some Anglo-Saxon and borrow a bell or two from the Pictish or from the Manxman, set all our mother tongue reeling with the eruption of obsolete vocables, disrupt it with all the grammars that are ground down to cement it, with obstacles, strew all the cricket pitches, the steep tennis lawns of our tongue, install a nasty cold in our larynx, a breathlessness in our lung. But let me have silence always in the centre of the shouting, that is essential. Let me have silence so that no pin may drop and not be heard, and not a whisper escape us for all our spouting, nor the needle scratching upon this gramophone of a circular cosmic spot. Hear me, mark me, learn me, throw the mind's ear open, shut up the mind's eye, all will be music, what? Sculpture of sound cannot, what cannot, as a fluid token words, that nothing else cannot.